Uh, well, uh, first, I'm uh, grateful to be part of uh, uh, today's uh, proceedings. Uh, in some ways, I feel uniquely unqualified uh, among the panelists. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, I think uh, Dr. Solomon was given kind of a macro level view. So I, I think I get, give the, ma the micro perspective. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, with a colleague of mine in the College of Education, Dr. Wayne Lewis, we became uh, part of a project, a group that was interested in promoting uh, greater discourse on policy and practice issues related to higher education, specifically in Kentucky. Um, if you're familiar with Kentucky at all, you know that it's a somewhat fragmented state politically. That tends to carry over uh, to our college and uh, university, to our higher education system. Uh, so we were interested in, in a, um, this project, and, and, and first let me preface it, I, I'm a great techie. Um, actually, up until a couple of months ago, my students really used to chuckle when I would take out my, my cell phone, which was, uh, they like to call it a dumb phone. It, you know, it's had the, the buttons, no screen, or, or, or anything like that. I, I, I'm, I'm, don't concern myself a lot, I, we were having a conversation about that, but, but I, am, I am a reluctant embracer of technology in many ways. I, I, I tend to use it in a very functional sense of what something I want to do, um, uh, but, but, but the idea people um, approached uh, Dr. Liz and myself about starting a journal that would help promote kind of discourse on, on issues facing Kentucky higher education and, and really the, the region and beyond. Uh, we had a graduate assistant who was working with us, and, and we were able uh, to connect with UK libraries and UK knowledge. Um, Pat, Mary Beth, and now Adrian have really been beneficial to us. As Dr. Son was talking about, we don't have the technical expertise. So uh, we were able, uh, through that process, uh, working uh, with UK knowledge, who works with digital commons, um, to be able uh, to put together, and we're still a, a, a modest operation. We have high aspirations, but, but we, a, a modest operation. We've had two issues out, um, working on our, our, our next two issues for volume two. Um, but for, for us, what open access meant uh, on a couple of levels. Um, on one level, again, because uh, as Terry was saying, the idea of open access does not equate with free. It became readily apparent to me there were some pretty substantial resources that were backing what we were doing because we would show up to these meetings and these magical people would say, ah, this is how you put together a journal. This is how we can do things like helping you with indexing this journal. This is how, how we can do uh, this process of going through publishing, going through the peer review process, things that uh, as an assistant professor, it was a project that I was interested in, uh, but I get to spend a, a lot of fun time in dark rooms typing in a keyboard on manuscripts uh, for my publications. Uh, so, uh, so we were able to avail ourselves of, of resources and expertise uh, that, that if it hadn't been for the library supporting it, it it's a project that would not have, uh, have, have happened. But a couple of things that this project has meant. Uh, one is uh, we originally, we have a co-editor who is now at a community college at Hopkinsville, but actually um, kind of in a Romeo and Juliet fashion was from the University of Louisville. Uh, so, and we, we actually are interested in creating, again, a dialogue with institutions around the state. So we had to make very careful choices. So if you go to our journal website, and I don't know if you remember this, Mary Beth, like one of the first mock-ups of the background was blue. And Wayne and I were like, no, no, no. So now if you go, it's got a nice green background <laughs> to it. Uh, but we were able to, uh, through this technology and through open access, uh, we've been able to connect with uh, faculty and professionals from around the state. So again, it's still a work in progress, but you see this conversation that is emerging. And we're actually really excited when we get submissions uh, from individuals uh, who again may be outside of Kentucky, but certainly at institutions uh, or campuses uh, within, the, within the state. And, and so for us, open access has been about, and frankly, I'm a, someone who studies higher education. When you look at higher education in the Commonwealth, again, you, you, 
it, and it goes back to some historical political rival, rivalries and regional issues that go on. It's been part of a process of, of really trying to get institutions to say, you know, we do have a lot in common. We have common goals related to our students and what we want higher education to accomplish uh, for the commonwealth. So, so for us, I, if you think about the cost that would have been associated with a print journal, or if you think about the cost and expertise that would have been associated if we'd had to do it ourselves, this is the kind of project that really wouldn't have been able to get off the ground very easily. I guess we could have done something, you talked about some of the early generation of journals. Uh, we, we could have done something like that. But one of the things that's been amazing to me um, is when I look at it, again, we're a modest operation, we won't talk about impact factors. But when I look at the number of downloads that we've had, even out of two issues, it make, and, and people will say, yes, we, we, we found this information, they'll get in touch with you. Uh, so for instance, we had uh, uh, one of our early publications has been about first generation college students. So I've had a couple of people uh, get in touch with me or I know the authors um, have talked about people have gotten in touch with them because they're interested in this issue. And when they see it's someone in Kentucky working on it, it, it again, it helps promote that dialogue. So, so again, this, this conversation that I think uh, would not necessarily have happened has been something that's been very important. Something that Brian talked about that, that we've also been able uh, to do with this process, and, and I'm someone who, I, uh, maybe it's because I don't exist in any of them very well, but I tend to straddle worlds with, I'm in a college of ed education, I have a law background, so I was very familiar with law publishing. And so we've really, I think probably one of the most satisfying aspects of our open access project has been the involvement of graduate students. So we have students who, working closely with faculty, uh, um, have been able to serve in editorial positions, which really mimics what I grew, I, I was on a law review, and that was a really valuable experience for me. So we have students who are involved in the meetings, uh, uh, consideration of issues, themes, and topics, that we want to explore. And so, again, for me, kind of at a, a, a micro street level view of what open access has meant, as, as someone who is a, a faculty member, one of the most important things I do is work with my graduate students. This is a way in the students that I have in class uh, or in other contexts that you can really emphasize how what they're doing in terms of their research and scholarship can have an impact, again, in, in joining a larger a larger discourse. Um, and, and I don't want to take too much time because I know that we want to have some questions, but I, I kind of want to shift gears now a little bit more to a, a macro level perspective. And as I've reflected on this and, and Dr. Solomon's comments and, and, and as we've talked about open access, the, the panel we were able to have a very engaging uh, phone conversation is, I think open access is also tied up into a larger issue and, and debates and discourses regarding higher education that are very fundamental on, on the basis uh, of one, we, we, we think of higher education as a public good or a private good. And so some of you might have been able to attend, we had a uh, colloquium on academic freedom at the College of Education in the spring. And we had Dean Robert Post of Yale Law School who was talking about the future of the professoriate and academic freedom. And at one point he said, really all of this is premised, this idea of it being academic freedom and what we want our universities to accomplish as places of free thought. We have to find a viable economic model. And so when I think about open access, and there's also discussion about the massive online course offerings and how we put together, uh, it, it's kind of a debate in a way, it, it, in, in other words, how do we fund the higher education enterprise to our scholarship and what we do is able to reach audiences, but how do we do it in a way that is financially sustainable? And so I think that for me, probably in my research and scholarship was more familiar in thinking about it on the student side, such as rising tuition. And again, this idea of state, we know well in Kentucky, uh, the lack of state support, it's something that's happened in other states. Um, but, but I also think that open access is really at the heart of this larger discussion about what it means to be a college or university, and in the case of UK and other, other institutions, a public institution um, as well, and how you distribute uh, that scholarship. So um, 
I'll close now, but I think that has struck me as, as I consider open access, that it really is a, a really fruitful area to kind of have this discussion about what we mean in terms of higher education as a public good and being able to distribute our knowledge um, instead of trying to put a price on it and somehow monetize it.